Okay. Sidearm, are you with us? In spirit as well as in virtual body? Let me check. Why? <laughs> yes, I am. Excellent. You're very welcome. Well, let me do an introduction. Um, so, um, <clears throat> I mentioned a little bit about Sidearm last week. Sidearm Madonna um, is a long, uh, a long time SL resident uh, and former participant of this module um, and one of the participants who has the honor of pretty much scoring about 100% uh, mark in the end of semester uh, assessments. Um, so he's a longtime friend of this module um, and has subsequently come back every year to help students with their final year projects to provide all kinds of resources, but in particular to um, to support this uh, class on team and team working and how teams work and how teams function in advance of us looking at the major project next week, which we're going to work on as part of a team. Um, Sightarm has a, a long professional history in the oil industry um, in, in Texas and, and I guess around the world. Um, and in that life would have been responsible for various kinds of teams. Um, he also has a long history uh, working in Second Life. Um, he used to manage, run and uh, coordinate Dublin Virtually Live. And I told you a bit about that last week. Um, and he has worked on a series of projects in, in Second Life and in other virtual worlds. So he comes with a wealth of experience, both practical um, and theoretical in terms of teamwork. He's developed a really, really interesting uh, talk over the course of the last kind of 10 years or so, um, which I suppose he's turned a lot of his actual practice into a theoretical base. So it's a very real um, explanation, I suppose, of how teams work with lots of really interesting examples from his various um, experiences. So um, listen with attention, um, but Sightarm will also involve you. He'll ask you questions and he'll ask you to get involved. So please do feel free to get involved. Feel free to use your voice and speak. But if you can't do that, then text. So maybe without further ado, I'd like to thank Sightarm for coming along this evening um, or this afternoon as it is in, in where you are um, and hand over to you, Sight. Okay, will do. I'm going to step up here. I want to thank you again, Tay, for inviting me and I really appreciate this opportunity I want to tell you what my goal for talking to you today is. My premise is that, like me in my early career, you have not had much, if any, formal training in team operations methods, although you have participated in many team projects. My premise is that you have had both positive and negative team experiences. And right now, I would like you to take a pen or pencil and a piece of paper, wherever you are, and jot something down. So I'd like you to recall a relatively recent positive team experience that felt good. Something about this team experience felt good. All you have to do for now is just type, a, I mean, write a, like a short word or phrase that will remind you of it. For me, for example, I might pick pricing application update. Just something short and sweet. Okay, next recall a team experience that felt bad or disastrous or had room for improvement and jot down a note or a phrase to remind yourself of that. That's all you have to do, just anything that popped to mind as relatively negative. For example, I might put down laptop project. So keep these at the back of your mind on that little piece of paper next to you. And, and as we go through this, maybe put little tick marks if something jogs your thinking, oh, I could use that there, or oh, I could use that there. And spoiler alert, at the end of this talk, I'm going to ask you to share some of those 
places that you put a tick mark. My intent from today's talk is that not only this talk, but your experiences in this class working as teams, some usable principles will sink in and carry forward in your further educational and professional work. Some of this stuff you probably are already familiar with or have a different name for, but it's still familiar. Some of it may be brand new, and some of it even may be an aha or give you a different perspective on something. So I want to begin with the end in mind. I would like to share a short video clip with you. So if we go back to this diagram that I've got on the wall that I'm standing next to, the video simply zoomed in on the upper left corner of the diagram and it had the word brainstorming. And then it zoomed out to the full graph and zoomed in again to the right half of the X and it said deciding. Then it zoomed out and zoomed in on lower right quadrant contending it zoomed out and back in again on the lower left quadrant called mirror ring, like looking in the mirror. And this is what I've been calling the partnership team building model or journey. And the key points about this diagram is that it summarizes visually and another perspective what I'm gonna talk about in detail today. Each learning cycle on a team project looks like this diagram. Each time you learn something as an individual looks like this diagram, these four stages. At the, each end, at the end of each of these cycles that you go through as a team or an individual, you are more accomplished and experienced, which is why the helix goes up. And each part of the cycle has a motif. In the case of the video, I use the musical motif. It has its own flavor, its own energy. In the brainstorming, it's kind of free and open. Da, 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 da. You know, yippee skippy, yay, we're, we're going to start a new project. Woohoo! What a weird place we're in. This is interesting. Then you go into deciding, and you have to narrow down and pick what you're going to work on. Da, 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 da. Okay, you're taking on a load there. Now you decided, and you're going to get into the real work. But that's contending. It's, it's a little chaotic. It's kind of like a video game war scene. That's why it's called contending. Then you push through, you come out, victory snatched from contending. The laurels are in your teeth and you are mirroring, looking at what happened and looking at each other and taking note of what worked and you'll do again and what you could do differently, which is dum, 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 very cheerful. So that is the metaphor for what we're going to talk about. Did anyone recognize the song from Brainstorming? One of you is very brave. Say it again. All right, Jacques. Yes. Good. All right. Okay, I'm now at the very first slide up here. And um, it says team operations model, and it has a box in it with some arrows. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but as a professional systems analyst, I am honor bound to describe everything with the box with arrows coming in and out of it. So I did that here. Team operations is in the middle. It has inputs, outputs, controls, and supports. The inputs are you, the team members, your time. The outputs are your results, especially when you do a project and present it at the end of the module. The controls are your assigned homework and your assigned project. And then supports. What helps you in team operations to do a good job? That's what I'm here to talk to you about. Commitment, competence, and processes, the team effectiveness factors. 
next slide here I'm alt clicking on is effective teams have effective members. Effective teams have effective members and effective members are defined by commitment and competence. Commitment means putting yourself into it. Yes, I will do this. I commit to it. And competence means I have some power in this area. I have some skill in this area. And it's important that you have both because they're like a multiplier effect. If you rated your personal commitment to this class, for example, on a scale from zero to one, and then you rated your competence in being able to take this class from zero to one and multiply those two together, you would get kind of a net ability to succeed. If you are fully committed and you're an ace at running around in Second Life and doing homework and reading assignments, that's one times one, that's one, that's 100%. On the other hand, if you're 100% committed to doing this and your computer is dead and you can't get in, so you're not able to do it, that's a zero. Zero times one is zero. So I hope that makes sense. But this comes up in real life. So that's commitment and competence. And we might talk about that later if some of you are putting tick marks next to that. Did anybody put a tick mark next to that? Tay, did you put a tick mark next to that? I sure did. Okay, good. I can always count on Tay. Okay, the next one is effective teams develop in stages. So the first stage is brainstorming, which was actually mentioned as a key stage on the partnership journey. Brainstorming is when you are figuring out where you're going. What, what should we do for our team project? Or what time should our team meet? Or what should we have for dinner? But in brainstorming mode, anything goes. That's why it's... I think we should have a team project on building a special app to monitor blood sugar embedded in the elbow so that nobody has to poke their fingers to bleed onto a test strip anymore. That's a crazy idea. That don't ever... No, no, you don't shoot that down. You let it fly. So brainstorming, you want to generate as many ideas as possible so that you have a bunch of ideas from which to choose, which then takes you into deciding, which is the next step. Just like in brainstorming, you're opening it up. Da, 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 da. Now you have to narrow it down. You have to pick what are we going to actually work out from all those good ideas. And in order to pick, you have to have a, an agreed team process. You either say consensus or have a leader that says what we'll do or vote on it, but some way to select so that the team members feel like, yeah, I can still commit to this. I really like this project idea we're going to do. I don't like it so much, but I can commit to it. Remember, you've got to have some non-zero level of commitment for this thing to work. Every time you get together as a team, you do something called briefing each other, telling each other. One of the first things you might do is, uh, what should we work on today? You might even discuss that even before you get together. Like, when should we meet again? And what should we do when we meet that time? Uh, well, we should get together at the classroom and we should test our sound or whatever. That's at the beginning. Debriefing is when something is over. For example, I'll debrief you at the end of this talk about what did you find that may or may not have applied to your positive and negative team experiences. Now, simple as it sounds, these four practices are incredibly useful. I worked before I started my company uh, at a corporation for 25 years. That's where I learned a lot of this stuff. And it, the big payoff was making meetings much more productive. Briefing, debriefing, etc. Okay, where are we at? Yeah, I skipped the stage. Well, they don't have to go in particular order. Okay, I'm now at effective teams develop in stages. Everybody look see that one okay? Actually, I do enjoy hearing your voices. I was here earlier doing a sound check, and several of you were very helpful doing that. So effective teams develop in stages. 
And the first stage is forming, which is where you, uh, for example, the first day you all met here with Tay, you were forming as the uh, autumn module of Is One Life Enough? What are your names? What are your backgrounds? What are your majors? I took time to look at your blogs um, this week, and uh, about half of you actually posted some background about yourself at that point. And so a lot of you are in interior design, which I find fascinating. So that's forming, finding stuff out about each other. Storming is when you, you've kind of gone through this brainstorming and now you're trying to decide what to do. And sometimes the first thing you storm on is how do we decide what we're going to do? And then another thing you might storm on is, do we need a leader in this team? Or is there a you know de facto leader? I mean, how do we coordinate ourselves voluntarily? And then there might be some storming on, you know, getting started. Okay, you said you would do this by next by the time we met again, and you didn't do it. I know, but uh, things happen, you know, I promise I'll do better next time. And by the way, you are late to this meeting. Oh, I know. I, we, I'm, could we start 30 minutes later? It would really help a lot because I blah, blah, blah. That takes, that's norming. So in norming, you start lining up, figure out how to work with each other. You've got roles established. You've got your agenda, your plan more or less established. This is when you time, many of you go off on your own and work independently and just periodically get together again. And that is performing where you are cranking it out. If you're in the class, you're doing your assignments, you figure out how to keep up with that audacious reading list that Tate gives you uh, and other assignments along with everything else you have to do as students and real life human beings and also working with your team members. So that is the stages. Okay. Now I demand to know if anybody besides Tay put a tick mark next to their project, their, their positive or negative team experience. You don't have to tell me what triggered your... Great, thank you. Um, excellent, perfect. Okay, the last one, this is, this, this is a visual slide. This best matches that contending uh, like that. So this is effective teams share roles. This one to me, when I first heard about it, business teams run competitions, business school, business schools run competitions or in their, their courses, they also have team projects like you do. And for example, each team has to plan and, and start up a virtual business and, and operate it, you know, virtually. It's a toy business, not a real business. And then, you know, the lecturer evaluates them at the end of it. And they started noticing a trend, people studying the results of these courses, that the most effective teams had about nine different roles that the team members were covering. And, and the first question I had was, what if I'm on a team of only three? How can three people cover nine roles? And it turned out that human beings are quite capable of covering two or three roles each. And different team members tend to be good at different roles here. So two of these roles are what would be called traditional leadership roles, shaper and coordinator. Shaper is the lion tamer cracking the whip. Let's get busy. There's a deadline. We only have X more classes before we have to do our presentation, etc. The coordinator is more like a chair that kind of sits back. And let's say during brainstorming, not everybody's contributing and they ask Susie to speak up a bit or Michael, don't be shy or they're kind of keeping their eye on the big picture. But those are only two of the nine roles. Then there's the team worker. This is the midfielder in a soccer game. You know, one end of the team is off there trying to shoot goals. One end of the team is trying to prevent goals from being shot. And then the midfielders are running back and forth, helping wherever they need to. Then there's the implementer, kind of just cranks it out, cranks it out. They know what the, you know what's supposed to be done, and they do it. And then the planner. Well, you always need a little bit of planning. So 
planter. That's a planter. The planter is not the planner. You do need a planner. The planter is the one that looks out for new ideas that nobody thought about. The investigator runs around checking out stuff, seeing what are the other teams doing. What else is going on in Second Life or the real world? A lot of times I play that role before I give these talks. Uh, finding things that, oh, that would be relevant to what Tay's doing now, etc. Well, the big surprise to the business team evaluators was they said, that's a lot of stuff. All you need is a lion tamer and the, the dull but reliable team worker. Let them crack the whip, crank it out, and they'll get everything done pronto and the rest will be left in the dust. But it turned out that wasn't true because they left out roles like the evaluator who looked for the missing crossing the T's and the I's that weren't dotted or, you know, fatal little mistakes like not having your microphone turn on when you come into class. Um, the finisher is the fine detail, the putting the polish on it, the thing that kind of knocks it out of the ballpark, over the edge. And the specialist, if you're making, well, for, for in my case, if you're making videos and stuff, you need to know how to work with video editors and codecs and stuff like that. You know, not, not stuff everybody knows about, but if your project brings that up, you need a specialist. Or if you're trying to write a script and you're going to give your talk on saving the world or your version of it, you might want a script that evokes the passion and feelings of your listeners and brings tears to their eyes. That's a specialist skill that can be done. You see it every day on movies and shows and telemundo. So anyway, those are the, sh the roles. And the most important point about the fact is when you look at yourself and your commitment and your competence, where are you a good fit for these different roles? So the point of all these slides If you look at it from an engineering point of view, you've got x-axis, y-axis, pro productivity increases. If you use stages, it increases. This implies that collaborating well is a technology. It's predictable, time-tested, and it works. You just have to learn it. And that is absolutely true. At the same time, it's an art. It calls for judgment tempered by experience and practice. And every time you go through one of these team projects, wherever it is, and around that partnership journey helix, these things will chime with you or resonate with you at new levels. And that's the art of it. So I'm not going to do the debrief part just yet. But I want to give you all a minute right now to put any more tick marks. Now that you see the four engineering points of view, put a little few tick marks or even a phrase next to those successful or disastrous projects so that when I come back later, you'll be ready with those. Let me know when you're done making tick marks, at least three of you, please. Okay, good. That's one. Thank you, Katie. All right. Thank you. Excellent. All right. So I want to add a few new thoughts. And what I want to share with you is some thoughts about what I call persona theory. And person, persona is from the word person, which is a Greek word, and it's persona theory. And the idea of persona theory is that each of us has a character that we play in real life. And that character, and the reason the Greeks called it persona is because on the Greek theater, everybody would wear a, a big robe and a mask, and you couldn't see who the real person was. All you could see was this character with a mask. And in order to hear them speak, the mask had to have a hole in it with a little tin horn, and that was the persona. Per means through and sound, is sona. So it, let the sound of your voice come through your mask and you could be heard. So it's really interesting to be with you in Second Life because 
what I'm looking at here is 12 or 13 avatars. Each one of those is a persona. There's some other words for that. Each of you here is a digital energy personality essence. Each of you here is a digital anthropomorphic personification. Each of you is an avatar. Sorry to interrupt you there, Sidearm, but uh, just out of curiosity, has your avatar and your persona changed much in the online world? You can change. I won't do it now, but in other classes, I've changed into eight different creatures. Changing your avatar look, gender, uh, or creature type. So, but that's a great point. That exactly speaks to it. Oh my God, in Second Life, you can have more than one avatar, more than one persona. Now let's go back to persona theory. Your flesh avatar also has multiple personas. I'll give you the simplest example. Every day I walk from home to my local coffee shop where I work because they have a really fast Wi-Fi and I work online and on. So when I'm walking on the street, and in the morning, you know, when traffic is busy, I'm careful to cross the street when cars aren't turning into me and uh, when people walk by. So my persona is cautious, pedestrian, friendly, stranger. I say hello to people. I just nod at them. I don't engage them in conversation, you know, friendly, non-threatening. That's important. When I get to the traffic light, I've got it figured out. I know how those traffic lights work. It's intersections of highways. I know when the walk light's going to go on, when the left turn lane for the cars goes on. I know when I can start crossing on the red light because no cars could possibly turn into me at that point and it's about to turn the walk light on. You know, that is savvy pedestrian, savvy traffic light, smart pedestrian. But the other day, I was about to do that and I looked and oops! The constable, the police car, was over there in one of those lanes. Guess what I did? I stood still. Law-abiding pedestrian, drawing no attention to myself. Now those may sound like trivial examples. Let me give you one that hits home more. When you guys go visit your parents, assuming you stay in dorms or something, or perhaps you stay with your parents, I don't know. Who are you being when you are with your mom or dad or aunt or uncle or family member? Is it the same persona that you're being here, for example, when you meet up ahead of class? Is it the same persona you're being when you go hang out with your friends on a Friday night? You're not the same. You keep changing your default set of behaviors and attitudes to suit the occasion. That's persona theory. Does this make sense? Yes, no. Maybe. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay, good. So now let's dig into it a little bit. Since each of us has multiple personas, at the same time, you can see from the examples I gave, each persona is tailored for a particular audience. One of my personas was tailored to police persons. <laughs> One of my personas is tailored to you. I'm putting on a persona right now. I'm, I'm speaking to university students. How do I want to get across to them? I'm also speaking to a officer of your university, and I have a slightly different persona embedded when I address that person. Each different audience your personas addresses, you have a purpose. You know, my purpose with you, I told you up front, you know, you, you get something out of this talk that lasts in the area of partnership team building or anything. I don't care. If something new sinks in and hits you, bang, and you're using it later, I'm happy. That's my purpose. If you're talking about all these other different personas, do you think there's one natural persona you'd fall into in general? Yes. That persona is who you think you are. That persona is yourself. Your audience for your natural who you are is you. 
You are your own audience when you're by yourself. This is a weird way to think about it, but it's also, at least when I think about it, I go, whoa. Do you say that your your virtual persona would change a lot more due to your your kind of physical persona having a habit nearly from like having the same repetitive, like your walk to the coffee shop, like that same touch, the same sounds, the same smells, the same cars, the same traffic lights. Do you think that that's fallen into like a habitable persona, whereas your virtual one you can just change as you wish of its surroundings? Oh. Um, it would change just as much as the real life. It depends on how active you are in the virtual world. When I was fully active and I was in Second Life every day, I was in uh, Dublin virtually live. I was uh, working with um, UCLA. We had a military project where they were using virtual worlds to train people how to work in foreign countries. Um, I was sidearm the entrepreneur. I also, as part of my duties, uh, when we first started Dublin, I was a hostess several times a day, several days a week. I had a hostess personality. I was cheers. Everybody knows your name. I called you by name. Hey, Katie. Hey, Cat. Hey, Hunt. Hey, Benny. Good to see you here. How are you doing? You know, but I was also a non-intrusive hostess. When we sound checked live musicians to come and perform, I said, you have to do a sound check the day before. We want to make sure you're Streaming is okay. I was professional sound check audio engineer, gave feedback on how they sounded. Then if it sounded good, I'd give them a pep talk. So that's because I spent every day for hours in Second Life. And yes, uh, you develop habit or habitable. I liked your word. Comfortable, different outfits you put on, personas suited, tailored to each purpose. This is persona theory. This is for you to think about, and if something about it grabs you, run with it. But to recap, each of you has multiple personas. Each persona, it tends to be tailored for multiple audiences, one persona for each audience. And then I want to come back to my key point, and each of those persona audience matches tends to have its own set of purposes. One purpose is to to look good. Another purpose might be uh, to develop yourself personally. I have a strong amount of purposes about learning stuff. Uh, another purpose would be professional, to get ahead uh, in your company or to get ahead in your educational career. Other purposes might be societal, to uh, make a difference, to volunteer uh, with youth groups or to volunteer with a service group. You can imagine, I don't want to get into too many examples. I mean, this to me is so rich, uh, and, and I feel like you guys think that too. So I have an evocative question for each of you. Where, you don't have to answer it, but you know, maybe jot it down. If it's true that you have multiple personas and multiple audiences, and, and you can even recognize what I'm talking about, and I'm saying that each of those matches has purposes, Fine, those are your purposes. Where did your purposes come from? That's it. Where did your purposes come from? All right. Yeah, no, 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 I'm not asking you to answer it. I'm asking you to jot it down or be annoyed by it. It's evocative. It's supposed to, you know, prod you. And I'll ask you, now we're going to get back to what we're talking about here. Look around you at these people that you're with. I don't know if you've assigned the teams yet or not. Who are these people on your team? Even the ones you think you know or you knew before. Who are they? Why are they in that avatar? Why did they pick that major? What do you think they're here for? What are their purposes? What do you think their skills are that they bring to the table? What roles do you think they might fill on your team? For that matter, who are you? You're on the team too. And that goes back to the other question. So the last thing I'm going to tell you about avatar theory, they've done official research, you all, about audiences. 
and the clickbait title was why you can only have 150 meaningful relationships why you can only have 150 meaningful relationships 150 oh my god they put a number on it does that feel limiting does that feel like too many so I had to read the article okay cat is typing away something's got her interested good so I dug into it and it's actually been around for a while it's research and it says well it's not just 150 but it's like the inner circle the inner circle of people you know the closest innermost circle and the max number you can have of your loved ones is five so you can have five other people that you are tight with loved ones or whatever you call this innermost circle luckily beyond that you can have 15 you can handle up to 15 good friends good friends I guess that's someone you could ask for a ride you know you can also have 50 friends just generic friends you know you might not ask them for a ride they might lend you a some money for a coffee if, if you make sure you pay it back soon but they're friends they know you and you kind of know each other 50 friends all right so good meaningful contacts is the 150 so contact meaningful contacts now you tell me what that means but for example when i think of tay tay i tend to think of you as 50 friends because i count on you to invite me to this thing you count on me to do a good job we kind of know we can count each other on but when we're busy we're busy and we're not offended if we don't respond to each other immediately you know but meaningful contacts you probably have a lot of these at school right now you probably have a lot of these where you work you know you know who they are and you interact a fair amount i have at my local coffee shop a couple i would call friends at a generic level like the manager i hang out with them and i talk to them about business and then the baristas and i kind of know what they're doing and what some of them are majoring in and what some of them like movie wise you know just enough to kind of acquaint uh, the next big jump is 500 acquaintances. Acquaintance. That means acquaintance. Acquaintance. And then finally, this is where we max out. 1,500 at the most. You can handle 1,500 people that you can recognize. And this, I would assume, means people like, you know, Taylor Swift or, you know, celebrities, political figures, people around the campus that you've heard of or somebody told you who they were and you recognize them when you see them again so that is uh, audience research i just think it's fascinating that that they were able to put numbers on this so enough of that that was my that was my something new for this talk so debrief i need a volunteer to tell me something that they picked up from today's talk that applies to either their positive or their negative experience in a team or just pick something that you think is going to be useful kababa kababa can you speak kababa soros good go for it um actually one one interesting thing you did bring up uh with the brainstorming thing when people are brainstorming um shooting ideas down i uh, i associated that to one of my negative um experiences in a group project like if you're shooting out ideas and someone's like no 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 totally ignore that it's very kind of it's not i don't want to say demoralizing but it's very it, like it puts the person down totally shuts them out so it's it's definitely something to consider and very good definitely keep part and keeping the the kind of process of a team project like nice and open not closing off any options it's, it was a really really good point thank you please in your chat box, start typing what you're going to. Yes, that's correct. Uh, Meg, brainstorming pushes ideas further and gets the best options. You can actually feel it open. It's open. I can speak, uh, and it lets the 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 introverts speak. Since so otherwise, you're missing out on on cool ideas. Um. So basically, I had a project for a f uh, it was three people in a film project, and brainstorming everything went perfect. Well, uh one person uh wasn't committed 
and we were all like relying on it and it just it was just like you know it's just the that level like it just doesn't work you know you need a hundred percent or a lot of commitment to the project or else you know it all kind of falls down because it yes. was a, a project thing you know it wasn't like me and the other person could finish the project because we needed the third person to engage and help and all that gotcha thank you chata are you there um i did a project recently and it was like we worked well as a team but it was one one person wanted to do everything and then i felt like i was not doing enough for the team so then i felt like i was kind of like slacking but my intention was to do more but she just wanted to do everything gotcha and how would you relate that okay i think it would be in the area of roles the more obvious roles apparently were all covered everybody else and you felt like you know what am i supposed to work on and some of these roles we will go into detail i bet you i bet you you'll find something aha i could do that next time so okay all right uh Ari, area says negative experiencing work on a team you always encounter dominating personalities very good Cat, I like the commitment and confidence. Competence. I have a recent project where we did CAD and SketchUp because we each had a strong skill that contributed to the team. Good. E real dominating personality. So anybody else have that issue? You were perhaps that's even what happened to you, Cat, where you're on this team and you're trying to participate, and then some one else or some others else are hogging it. Yeah, basically. Ah, Lou. Um, I uh, I wouldn't relate it quite to uh, like the ideas I've down, but earlier on we were talking about like the different personalities used for um different situations. I always find that you should put a lot more energy in in like team situations. Uh, like you're bringing up earlier on, like because you put a completely different personality on for something like that, it's quite draining sometimes on yourself to put to put forward a different foot if that makes sense yes i just saw another comment there it just faded out but what could help in this dominating personality and it might not help so first of all that's the role of the court the cord coordinator's role or one of them as i look at it is to recognize somebody's being mr or ms dominant and politely get them to s s chill and then bring out the other people that aren't speaking up yet. Now this works if the person who's the coordinator is either officially the coordinator, like the, you know, one of the senior members of the team, or uh, in the case I was in with the corporation was the officially designated facilitator for the team. And they have the they have the authority where the dominant person listens. Um, however, if you're just in among a team of peers, somebody will have to step up and be the coordinator and say, "Well, just a minute, you know that that's good, but we aren't hearing everybody else's ideas. You know, chill, step back." Now, the case where this doesn't work is if somebody in the room who's hogging it is. The CEO, the department manager, the department dean, the president of the university, the owner of the business, um, or has some other formal official role that you're taking a risk to try to ask them to, you know, chill for a while. So that begs the question, now what? Now what? Now what? And the short answer is life's not perfect you have to work around it maybe you get together outside of that person or just roll your eyes and go with it uh, that project may be inherently limited and capped because of that uh tay you're standing up are you gonna are you calling time or what do you want to do 
And I think we've kind of come to a natural, um, I won't say conclusion site, because uh, you've opened up some really interesting topics. Um, and I think we could probably go on for quite a bit longer. Um, but I'd like to thank you very much indeed for a really stimulating and interesting discussion. Um, <clears throat> as ever, you've introduced new topics and new ideas. Um, you guys uh, in the class won't recognize that as much as, as I will, but obviously um, Sight and I have sat through a number of talks together. Every time he presents this, he has a different angle. It makes it interesting for me as well as for you guys to listen to. One thing I might just pick up a little bit on is the really interesting segue into Persona. Um, that's something obviously we're going to pick up on later on in the module. You'll notice there's a module. Uh, I don't remember which class it is, but we look at the... Uh, the persona and personality of our avatars and ourselves. But I would link it back, I think, um, as you did, Sightarm, to the roles that people can play in teams as well. So there's a, it's, it's really interesting to hear it can take some practical applications for the link between personas and the different roles we play at different times. So let me also uh, formally thank Sightarm and clap. Uh, and thank you very much indeed, Site, for, for returning to us um, and presenting a most enjoyable and instructive evening. You are very, very welcome. And thank all of you for teaching me more. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to thank all you guys in the class as well. Um, you really participated. Uh, thanks for joining into the discussion. It's really, it's great to get that kind of feedback, and it does make the class much more interesting for everybody if you're engaging with it in, in that fashion. So well done, and thank you all very much indeed. And we'll see you next week.